Welcome to a new edition of System Update. I'm Glenn Greenwald. This episode focuses on a country that was very prominently in the news at the end of 2019 as a result of a violent, brutal, and savage military coup that removed the country's democratically elected president and replaced it with an unelected right-wing faction, but has since disappeared from the news despite the fact that democracy has not been restored. And that country, of course is Bolivia. Now, the first question that I think arises and arose for us as we decided to devote the show to this topic this week, and I think for other people who have heard about the topic as well, is why in the midst of a global pandemic that is capturing the attention of billions of people around the world and upending their lives, combined with an economic crisis brought about in part by that pandemic, as well as in the United States and elsewhere, a inspiring, sustained protest movement against racism and police abuse. Is it worthwhile to create this space and time and energy to focus on what's happening in Bolivia? And I think the answer is multiple. First of all, Bolivia is in and of itself an important country, a very important country. It's a country of 11 million people with an extremely interesting and and unique mix culturally and religiously and ethnically and racially where the indigenous population of Bolivia is the majority and yet has spent decades repressed and without power at the hands of a European descendant wealthy, white, Christian minority that imposed its own values in a very repressive way on that country, creating huge amounts of instability. It's also incredibly important because ever since the election of in 2006 of Evo Morales as president, it became a thriving, prosperous, stable democracy in a region which has had far too few examples of those kinds of democracies. And that model has been extremely important for the region and for the world. It's also important because it has vital resources that are becoming of increasing importance to the world, particularly lithium, which is crucial for the competition between China and the United States and other countries for things like electric cars and certainly its lithium-rich status played an important role in the events that led to this coup. But I think most important of all, the reason why it's really worth focusing on is what it says about the United States, what it says about the role of the U.S. government in the world, and for me, even more importantly, more revealingly, more interestingly, the way in which propaganda plays such a crucial role and how our most respected and prestigious media outlets and foreign policy commentators either disseminate propaganda willingly on behalf of the U.S. government and its agenda, or in many cases are simply victimized by propaganda, thinking they're very insightful and sophisticated experts about the world, when in fact their perspective is extremely distorted by their own jingoistic vision in Bolivia, the events in Bolivia of last year through up until right this moment where there is still no democracy in Bolivia, where the right-wing military coup leaders still govern, really provides a very vivid illustration of how all of that works. And I think it's very worth examining for that reason. To help me do that, joining me in just a few minutes, I have two leading specialists on in the region and in Bolivia specifically. One is Catherine Lebeder. The other is Mark Weisbrot, who have played a really important role in bringing the truth about Bolivia to the world. But before we get to those two guests, I just want to give an overview of first the events that led us to where we are in Bolivia, and then also the reasons why I think it's so important to focus on it even at this moment, especially at this moment. Now, as most of you probably know, in October of 2019, Bolivia held a presidential election. And Evo Morales, who was the three-term president of Bolivia, having first been elected in 2006 and then twice re-elected after that in what were as universally regarded as free and fair elections, nobody doubted he was by far the most popular politician 
in Bolivia, thanks to the indigenous majority, but also support, growing support in other sectors as well, decided to run for a fourth term, which was controversial first legally and then politically, but ultimately a court cleared the way for him to run for that fourth term. And when he ran, he won. Nobody doubts that he won. But what happened was the Organization of American States which in Latin America is widely regarded as nothing more than an imperialistic arm or instrument of the U.S. State Department, but in the United States is regarded as this neutral arbiter of what free and fair elections are. That is one of the propagandistic gaps between what people who live in the region recognize and what leading foreign policy commentators in the United States failed to understand what is the Organization of American States. It issued a report almost immediately after the vote claiming that there was widespread irregularities and fraud in the voting results. Nobody doubts that Evo Morales got more votes than all of his other opponents. The issue was in order to avoid a runoff, a second round runoff, he needed to win by 10 percentage points or more. And what was contested was whether he had actually obtained that margin. The claim from the OAS was that he only won by seven or 8% and the nine or 10% that was ultimately added to the official results was the byproduct of fraud for no reason other than the fact that the results were coming in showing a tight margin and then suddenly a the margin expanded to the point where it needed to be for him to avoid the runoff. Something that every person in the United States ought to be very familiar with where we all watch election results where certain precincts come in in favor of one candidate and then suddenly the results wildly and radically shift and change because precincts more favorable to the other candidates start to come in, which is exactly what happened in Bolivia. The strongholds of Evo Morales have always been the rural areas, distant from the capital, where the indigenous population lives, where poor people live, which are the results that naturally came in last, which is why the election results changed. But the fact that the OAS claimed that there was election fraud is what served as the pretext that allowed the Bolivian police and military operating on behalf of a right-wing party that has never received more than 4% of the vote in national elections to tell Evo Morales that not only was he not going to assume the presidential term to which he had just been elected, but that he was forced to leave his own country under threat of violence. His family was threatened, his allies was threat were threatened, and he himself was threatened with arrest. And in November of 2019, he fled to Mexico, where he was granted asylum to Mexico City. And in his place, a previously obscure senator, Janine Inez, was declared the interim president. She hails from the white, wealthy, European descendant Christian part of the country, represents that party, that faction. She declared herself the interim president, which is always the term that coup leaders use to imply that they're benign caretakers of the democracy, just transitioning it from the prior supposedly illegitimate government to legitimate democracy. And yet very predictably, here we are 10 months later, she continues to be the quote unquote interim president, no election has been held. There was one scheduled and then canceled using the excuse of the coronavirus. And the problem now is that all public opinion polls in Bolivia show that Morales' party, MAS, is leading all of the other candidates, which means they will have done all of this for nothing if they allow a free and fair election actually to proceed, which is why they're now conspiring to increase their levels of repression and to ensure that no free politics can take place. So that's where we are. We have Morales, who now is in Argentina. He went from Mexico to Argentina, where he obtained asylum there. And this right-wing repressive regime, which, let's remember, the first thing it did after taking over was it massacred 
protesters, indigenous protesters, supporters of Morales, and had the army murder dozens of them and then instantly in, in, gave, vested the military officials responsible for that massacre full legal immunity, which is a violation of the Geneva Convention and other international law to ensure that there was no accountability. And obviously that was extremely intimidating to Bolivians when it came to the question of whether they would be able to protest, watching dozens of people just massacred on the street by the military, which was then given full-scale immunity by this unelected right-wing government that continues to rule Bolivia. Now, as I indicated, one of the things that fascinates me about the events in Bolivia is what it reflects about how propagandized mainstream U.S. foreign policy discourse is about the rest of the world, because when the military took over Bolivia, when it ejected Evo Morales with force and threats of violence, despite his being democratically elected and the most popular politician in Bolivia, when it imposed a right wing faction that never could have been elected on its own, huge numbers of media outlets and foreign policy commentators, not on the right or the left or the center, but across the political spectrum, virtually the entire mainstream of U.S. opinion-making elites, declared in the most Orwellian fashion that Bolivian democracy had been saved as a result of the coup, not destroyed. You can read... All, you, I mean, the number of, of examples is too numerous to comprehensively chronicle of people who barely without even knowing anything about Bolivia suddenly announced because the U.S. Depart State Department said so that Evo Morales himself, the person democratically elected to lead then govern the country, he was the threat to democracy and the military and the police and the right wing faction that took over contrary to the results of the democracy, the coup leaders were the ones who were actually saving Bolivian democracy. Think about how Orwellian that is. It's hard to imagine anything more Orwellian than calling a military coup a attempt to save democracy and calling the democratically elected leader of a country the enemy of democracy. And yet we've seen it over, we saw it over and over during the course of that first month. One example was Yasha Monk, the foreign policy correspondent for The Atlantic, who in a series of tweets and then in an article in The Atlantic claimed that Evo Morales was the threat to Bolivian democracy and ejecting him forcibly from the country was the only way to save Bolivian democracy. Another person who said something similar was the former Obama official and ambassador to Russia, Michael McFall. Another was the editor-in-chief of Mother Jones, the progressive magazine named after a woman who was a genuine rebel and radical and agitator, Clara Jeffrey, the editor-in-chief, now taking the U.S. State Department line following Mike Pompeo, that Evo Morales himself was a threat to Bolivian democracy, which had now been preserved as a result of the plotting by the right-wing coup leaders. Of course, The Economist, which always takes a leading role in claiming that the removal by force of any democratically elected leader who's even a little bit to the left of center is a pro-democracy movement. And so too did the New York Times and the Washington Post in a series of news articles, as well as in a series of editorials, praise the coup leaders, or at the very least, if not praising the coup leaders, if condemning them for their massacres, suggesting that it was Morales himself who was a threat to democracy. Now, one of the ways they all did that was by instantly declaring the OAS report to be gospel. And this is one of the points that I think is so interesting. Living here in Latin America, if you speak to anybody in Latin America, in Brazil, in Argentina, in Chile, in Peru, in Colombia, anywhere, in Uruguay, in Paraguay, you talk, if you ask about the OAS, people will say, oh, the OAS is an instrument of the United States State Department. It's how the U.S. State Department, 
tries to interfere in Latin America under the guise of this neutral regional organization that, in fact, the United States, through funding and other uses of soft power and force, actually controls. That's the perception of the OAS. In the United States, the fact that that perception exists throughout Latin America is not even known to the kinds of people I just cited. They don't even know that there's a controversy about the OAS. They think the OAS is just really what it, the U.S. State Department purports it to be. This neutral democratic body composed of all the different governments around Latin America that in a very noble and fair way adjudicate regional disputes. Or maybe they do know the actual perception of what the OAS really is and they pretend that it's what the U.S. State Department wants it to be because they're active propagandists. But whatever else is true, all of the people that I just cited, including the New York Times, The Economist, and The Washington Post, took the OAS report that there was fraud in the Bolivian election as gospel. They repeated over and over, the findings of the OAS demonstrate that there is fraud in the Bolivian election. Nine months later, that report from the OAS has been so debunked that it itself is now regarded as fraudulent. What was fraudulent was not the Bolivian election or the official results that declared Evo Morales the winner. What was fraudulent was the report of the OAS that purported to find fraud where no fraud existed, to the point that even the New York Times last, last month reported on a new study which was not the first one, there have been many, but it's just simply a new one by three scholars who dissected the OAS report and definitively concluded that there was no concrete evidence of fraud within that report. There had been other reports prior to that, including from Mark Weisbrot's organization with whom I will speak very shortly, who which issued a preliminary finding shortly after the OAS report aggressively criticizing it and then issued a definitive report two months later proving that what the OAS said was completely false, that it itself was a fraud. So the entire storyline in the West, in the mainstream media outlets of the United States from our most respected and prestigious foreign policy commentators was completely fraudulent. The idea that the OAS had proven that the election results were manipulated or illegitimate. The election was completely legitimate. What was fraudulent and manipulated was the foreign policy commentary that came from all of the people who I just cited. And what's really interesting and revealing and amazing and important is that ever since even the New York Times acknowledged that reports have proven that the OAS report was fundamentally flawed, not one of those people that I just named who hailed the coup against Evo Morales on the ground, at least in part, that his election victory was fraudulent and therefore the coup was saving Bolivian democracy. Not Yasha Monk, not Michael Mafal, not Clara Jeffrey, not The Economist, not one of them has even uttered a word about these new findings? Do you think that they went back and provided any accountability for themselves saying, oh, I praise the Bolivian coup based on an OAS report that has subsequently been repeatedly debunked by neutral scholars to the point where even the New York Times published a story despite their own reliance on that report, acknowledging that it was, ex of course they didn't do that because they know they don't have to. When you are a US foreign policy commentator, or writer, as long as you're echoing the line of the U.S. State Department, even when it's under the Trump administration run by Mike Pompeo, as long as you're in accordance with U.S. foreign policy and serving U.S. interests, there's no accountability. You can get caught lying. You can get caught issuing fraudulent statements or propagandizing or making grotesque errors. And there's no need for you to ever even address your critics, their critics, if you do that because they know that they've served a cause that will always provide them career security. How can you trust The Atlantic or Mother Jones or Michael McFall or The Economist or The Washington Post or The Times?
when they don't acknowledge their own errors. At least the New York Times did report on this study. The Washington Post also had previously reported uh, or published an op-ed by sco other scholars saying the OAS report was unreliable and fraudulent, but didn't acknowledge that they themselves had cited that very report repeatedly in their news articles about Bolivia that led huge numbers of people to believe something that was false, which was that the election itself was fraudulent. There's just no accountability in this kind of punditry, in this kind of reporting, in this kind of foreign policy analysis, because as long as you hew closely to the line of the U.S. State Department, you know you're always going to be protected and immunized. That's how propaganda works. Why hasn't a single one of those people, despite the calls by many, including myself and others, for them to do so, why haven't they even addressed these questions about what it is that they said, let alone acknowledged error. It's because it's how propaganda functions. Now, this other prong of foreign policy propaganda that the U.S. has been drowning in for decades during the Cold War is one that got applied to the example of Bolivia and is very common. Constantly throughout the Cold War, whenever the CIA would topple a democratically elected regime and replace it with right-wing dictators, right-wing repressive uh, factions. The U.S. media would use that same Orwellian formulation that was used for Bolivia. They would claim that the coup against the democratically elected leader was not an attack on democracy, which is by definition what it is when you have a coup against a democratically elected leader. They would portray it as a pro-democracy effort, an effort to save democracy from the democratically elected leader. We saw this over and over. The journalist Vincent Bevins, who I interviewed for System Update several weeks ago, wrote a book on the history of the CIA in the Cold War and documented case after case in which CIA efforts to topple democratically elected regimes were called attempts to protect democracy by the New York Times that had been working hand in hand with the CIA in order to coordinate their messaging, the New York Times editors and the CIA, preventing reporters from reporting on what actually happened, that democracy was attacked in places like Guatemala or Indonesia, and forcing reporters to write that democracy had been saved. The same thing happened in 2002 when Hugo Chavez, which no matter what you think of him, was a very popular leader in Venezuela, elected in fair and free elections. And in 2002, a coup was attempted by right-wing business leaders with the support of the Bush administration. And the New York Times published a now notorious editorial calling it a salvation of Venezuelan democracy from a would-be dictator. They said it had, that the country was fortunate to have been taken over by a respected businessman. Again, depicting a coup against democracy as something designed to save democracy. Now, one of the things that I think is really fascinating is that one can understand, despite the atrocities that were committed in its name, why that was done during the Cold War, what the motive was. There was a global competition between the Soviet Union on the one hand and the United States on the other, and proxy wars were constantly being waged to try to ensure that governments that were governing countries were governed more to, to be more favorable towards the United States than toward the Soviet Union. That explains so many of the coups that were perpetrated by the CIA or with the help of the CIA in Latin America and in places like Asia and, and around the globe throughout the 50s and 60s and into the 70s. But there's no more Cold War now. Which leads to the question of what what is the motive now for doing that? Why does the United States continue to do things like support and applaud and cheer for a right-wing military coup in Bolivia that removed the democratically elected president? And I think it's an even more fascinating question in the context of Bolivia because Evo Morales despite the kind of caricatures that always get depicted and disseminated by the sort of writers I previously mentioned about anyone slightly to the left of center in Latin America, was not some dogmatic communist. He didn't 
nationalize industries and murder the wealthy and take away land and give it to the poor. It was a very kind of soft socialism. And not only was it a kind of soft socialism, it was a, an economic policy that thrived and succeeded even by the metrics used by neoliberal institutions like The Economist. For the first time in decades, Bolivia experienced sustained economic growth under Evo Morales that not only helped the poorest people in Bolivia and the indigenous population in Bolivia to have opportunities that they never previously had, but the wealthy in Bolivia continued to do very well under Morales. So the question then becomes, well, why was there so much hostility toward him in the West, in the United States, by international capital, by the wealthy sectors in Bolivia, when even the economists had been acknowledging that Bolivia was thriving even by the metrics used by neoliberals? The same thing was always the question in, in, in Brazil under the center-left but not communist president, Lula da Silva, where Brazil experienced massive economic growth. And yet, at the same time, there were all kinds of wealthy sectors in Brazil and international capital sectors in the West that continued to be vehemently opposed to the worker part, the workers' party of Lula to the point where they ended up impeaching his successor that he had handpicked, as well as ultimately imprisoning him unjustly. And I asked Lula when I interviewed him in 2019, while he was still in prison, before he was freed, exactly that question. He kept saying over and over, what you have to understand is the elites hate me, the wealthy hate our party, they're devoted to the destruction of our party. They've all And I asked him, Look, why why would that be? Why is that even convincing? Because despite the propaganda of your party, the reality is the rich did very well under the governance of the Workers' Party in Brazil. It is true that millions and millions of people were lifted out of poverty and had opportunities for the first time, just as was true in Bolivia. But it was also true in Brazil, just as it was true in Bolivia, that the rich did very well because economic growth helps business, help the uh, private sector that continued to pr be preserved. Again, just like Morales, Lula did not nationalize industries or, or dissect the private sector. The private sector remained fully intact. So I asked him, why would they be opposed to you when they did so well under your presidency? And his answer was fascinating. He said, because they were the resentment that they had toward us was not economic, it was cultural. For the first time in Brazilian history, the wealthy, the white wealthy sectors of Brazil had to go to the airports and their shopping malls, and they were seeing this new middle class composed of black Brazilians, people from favelas whose children were able now to go to college. And seeing their sectors, their realms that had been once so exclusive now being invaded from their perception by people who they thought didn't belong there as a result of these cultural and economic transformations created not economic resentment against Lula's government, but cultural resentment. So I asked Evo Morales when I went and interviewed him in Mexico City just a month after he was forced to leave the country. The same question, why is it you keep claiming that the wealthy in Bolivia hate you so much when they did quite well under your, and he gave the same answer, because they had to see the indigenous that they've always viewed as inferior, as less than human, suddenly living lives next to them, with them, in their institutions, having similar opportunities to their children, and they resented it culturally because that was always their exclusive preserve. Now, just one observation on my interview with President Morales that I think uh, illuminates all of these issues. When I asked him what he thought was the rationale for this coup and why the U.S. supported it, he called it a lithium coup. He believes that the desire to control the lithium market and the resources in Bolivia played a crucial role in why the United States was interested in having a government rule Bolivia, that it could con control much more than it could obviously control President Morales himself. <clears throat> but the other aspect of that interview that I found really remarkable that occurred to me afterwards 
is when I spoke to Morales and I, the interview lasted about 90 minutes, I found him to be one of the most thoughtful and uh, critically minded and independent thinkers of any politician I've ever interviewed. And I've interviewed world leaders and uh, leaders of political movements and parties across the West, across the world. And I found him to be one of the most impressive. And it really struck me afterwards how we've almost never heard anything from Eva Morales. How many times have you ever seen Eva Morales interviewed? And the reason that's kind of shocking is because not only is he a, the president of a sovereign country who has seen it all, he was president from 2006 to 2019 through the Bush administration, the Obama administration, the Trump administration in the middle of a region that is complicated and important politically, culturally, and economically and geostrategically to the world. But he's also somebody who, as I indicated, governed successfully. He brought stability to a country that never had it. He ushered in economic prosperity and growth to a country that no one expected would ever enjoy it. He brought opportunity to millions of people while at the same time preserving the private sector to the point where they didn't rebel against him or wage war on him. He was an incredibly successful president. That's the kind of person you would expect to hear from frequently. And yet in the West, we virtually never did. Why not? Because the West doesn't want to hear from people like Eva Morales because they're not servants of Western interests. That's how propaganda functions as well, is that the people who have views that are contrary to the interests of the United States and of Western capital, who can offer an alternative to hardcore capitalism and opening of markets and globalism of the kind the United States demands and subservience to the U.S. State Department and U.S. global interests, those are the kinds of people that need to be disappeared so that they can't inspire people in the United States to start questioning how that kind of politics might be able to work to improve the lives of American citizens as well. And that's the reason why, when you ask, why would the United States care about removing Eva Morales? Why did Mike Pompeo applaud so vociferously this military coup? Why did these foreign policy columnists and analysts who always follow the U.S. government line across the political spectrum, including even Clara Jeffrey and Yasha Monk and Michael McFall, why did they care so much about the removal of Eva Morales? He wasn't some hardcore doc communist that might explain it. He wasn't starving his own people. Bolivia was doing very well. Why did they consider it a positive thing? And that is the answer. And it's always been a major part, even during the Cold War, is the one thing the United States can't tolerate and won't tolerate is a successful model of left-wing governance because they're petrified that it will inspire other examples around the world. And what they hate just as much and goes part and parcel with it is any attempt by any kind of country to forge an independent and sovereign path. One of the things Evo Morales did that caused a lot of animosity toward him in those sectors of the media and government was he expelled a U.S. diplomat, the U.S. ambassador, on the grounds that they were spying on the Bolivian government, which is a violation of all diplomatic protocols, something that the U.S. diplomatic corps does constantly, as we reported in our Snowden reporting. And that was viewed as an affront that he was asserting the sovereign rights of Bolivia against the United States in a region that since the Monroe Doctrine, the United States believes is their right to rule. One of the most fascinating examples of that is in 2018, I interviewed the former democratically elected leader of Ecuador, Rafael Correa. And one of the things that he did upon assuming office that caused him to be hated by the West almost from the start was that there had been a U.S. military base on sovereign Ecuadorian soil that he insisted be removed. He said, why should the U.S. have a military base in our country? Why should the U.S. military be stationed on our soil? I want this military base removed. And when the U.S. government objected, he said, you know what? I'll make you a deal. You can keep your military base in Ecuador if Ecuador can have a military base in Miami. And that was laughed at and scoffed at as something 
ridiculous and absurd, almost insane and trollish, the idea that there should be equality and reciprocity and sovereignty between the United States and smaller, poorer, and less powerful countries in Latin America. And whatever leader forges an independent path, like what Lula did when he worked with Turkey to try and forge a nuclear deal with Iran that the United States Department didn't support, or what President Correa did when he expelled the U.S. military bases, or what President Morales did when expelling the U.S. diplomat, that is considered such an affront to the natural right of the United States to be supreme. That is what American exceptional, exceptionalism is, that that is what creates this kind of hostility that leads people across the ideological spectrum to applaud a military coup against not only a popular democratically elected leader, but one of the most successful in the history of the region. And yet, so, and for because of all of that, Bolivia is now yet one more example of a healthy, thriving, vibrant democracy. One that was improving the lives of millions of people who for the first time had opportunity for a better life. This is another example of that kind of democracy being destroyed with the approval and cheering, if not the active participation of not just the United States government, but its servants and spokespeople and propagandists in the U.S. media, in our most respected institutions, which is why Bolivia is such an interesting and important example and such a tragic example to consider. And it deserves the attention that it hasn't been getting for understandable reasons throughout 2020. But as they plot to ensure that this election doesn't happen, knowing that they're going to lose and that Morales' party will return to power, it really deserves the attention of the world. I really hope that you um, watch that interview. It's on YouTube. I regard it as one of the best interviews I've ever done, not because of anything I did. Um, I arrived with the list of questions that I think most people would have asked. His answers were really fascinating. And particularly at that moment, having just been the victim of a coup and forced out of his country, obviously a traumatizing event for him and his family. Um, and yet at the same time, so focused and centered and analytically clear about the events that took place made it a remarkably compelling interview that I, if you haven't watched, really hope that you will. I think it shines additional light on all of this. That's why we decided to devote our show to something that very few people in the West are talking about. And to help me explore it, I have two extremely informed uh, and important guests. One is Catherine Ledeber, who is the director of the Andean Information Network. She's lived in Bolivia and been an activist there working with primarily female coca farmers uh, for the last 30 years and knows Bolivia inside and out as an activist. And the other is my, Mark Weisbert, who is an economist and co-director of the Center for Economic and Policy Research, who, which is the organization that instantly recognized the fraud of the OAS report, pr produced a preliminary report dissecting the OAS report and all of its flaws, and then the definitive report proving that what was fraudulent was not the election results that re-elected President Morales, but the OAS report itself and the discourse that it produced predictably and by design in the West and in the United States designed to support and cheer and sanction the destruction of Bolivian democracy and to depict it as saving uh, Bolivian democracy. So I think these conversations with each of them, uh, understandably given their expertise and the role that they've played in these events is very illuminating for understanding exactly what happened in Bolivia, both last year during the coup and since, and why it matters so much, even given the multiple crisis we're all facing and why it merits uh, the attention that we hope this show brings to it. So I hope you enjoy the show. Joining me now to discuss not just the coup that took place in 2019, but the ongoing situation in Bolivia is a specialist and expert who has lived in the country for 30 years and has been a researcher. She's the director of the Andean Information Network, Catherine Ledeber. Thank you so much, Catherine, for taking the time to talk to me. Thanks so much for having me, Glenn. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to do so. Um, as I think I mentioned, so many of my colleagues who report on Bolivia have um, often said that among all their sources, um, you're the most knowledgeable and, and really encouraged me to talk to you. So I'm so glad we got to do this. Um, what I'd like to do is start by asking you, um, obviously, we're focused on the coup and, and the aftermath, but to focus on the key figure uh, in all of these events, at least until 2019, who was the three term about to be four term president, Eva Morales. Um, I actually traveled to Mexico City the month after he was forced under threat of violence by the military and the police to flee the country and interviewed him in Mexico City. And and one of the things that I walked away was kind of shocked at how here was a president who had presided over a country that had almost never experienced any real stability, let alone growth, uh, success with the kind of metrics that even neoliberal institutions like The Economist value. He has incredible insight given that he was governing a country for since 2006 and has seen it all. Um, And yet we almost never hear from him, um, despite all the reasons we ought to. So what can, how how do you describe the presidency of, of Eva Morales? Why was his presidency important and how is it that it transformed Bolivia? Sure. I, I think it was very important. And it's it's only now that you can see the kind of transformations that have taken place when, when you know, the extension of rights for indigenous people, the attention to rural areas and to social de- development and to issues like health and uh, infrastructure, education, all of these things that were noticeable leaps in 14 years. And now that they've been taken away in an almost eight month period, even before the pandemic, I think that it's very important to highlight that the the minimum wage increases, the quality of life for people, because I think that's really one way that there are several ways you can measure the efficacy of the government. And one and the basic one is the well-being of people and the uh, equality and rights. Uh, certainly it wasn't perfect. Certainly in 14 years of presidency, there were many errors, but there were many, many gains, too. And I think that this is at a point in time where we have a an illegitimate, unconstitutional government that's trying to roll back 14 years of gains and pretend that that hasn't happened. So let's talk about those gains, because um, I see a really interesting parallel in assessing uh, the Morales presidency, at least with respect to what you describe as those gains and the presidency of Lula da Silva in Brazil, where there were also obviously huge amounts of gains for large parts of the population that had almost never received any before. The kind of history of the Cold War, when the U.S. opposes vehemently a a government devoted to distributing resources more equitably or helping parts of the population that have been without nothing, has been a history where there's a perception that there's just redistribution, kind of a kind of hard communism or even soft communism, where the idea is to just take private enterprise, destroy it and distribute it to the people in the name of helping them. And in the case of both Lula and Eva Morales, that clearly isn't true, that both countries experienced economic growth. The rich in Bolivia and the rich in Brazil did very well under both Morales and in Lula. They continued to thrive, maybe not to the extent they did when there was no attempt to reduce inequality, but certainly they did very well. There wasn't massive seizures of property or nationalization. What is it that accounts, in your view, in Bolivia for there being so much hostility toward Morales among the minority elite, given that they actually fared pretty well during the course of of his governance? I think that it's a combination of things. One, 
with this governing elite that once was a landed elite and never then really moved into a new area is that this monopoly that they had on political power, what they used to call a pacted democracy where traditional parties would make alliances to, to, to take power, really was built on a strong relationship with the United States, bolstered by US foreign policy, uh, cemented by a very repressive and proposed U.S. drug war. And then it was the, the inability of the political elite or the traditional political parties to recover electorally. It's not that they were destroyed. It was, it's not that they didn't have the ability to run in elections. They developed no concrete proposals. They developed no strategic grassroots alliances. They never learned how to talk or engage or interest, take any interest in the needs of the broader population. You know, this rising tide raises all ships, maybe a poor metaphor in a landlocked country. But it's something that, that you know, it's the difference or your level of superiority over people that's rewarding to you. Because what you saw was a moralist government that had a lot of people who hadn't gone to college, who hadn't finished high school, a lot of uh, a young generation of very hardworking uh, technocrats and, and skilled individuals that to a certain extent did a better job with macroeconomic issues, did a better job with meeting the, the population. So they were humiliated, one, because they lost political power, but because two, they were less skilled and they didn't work as hard. And that was very noticeable. And here we yeah, are. Yeah, it's amazing. The resentment is so similar when when Lula finally rose to power. They said, how is, you know, an uneducated uh, son of, uh, you know, with 11 siblings who was illiterate until he was 10 and no educate, no, no formal education in economics going to manage a complicated economy like Brazil. And yet it experienced massive economic growth unlike anything that the geniuses before him was able to accomplish and that resentment was very real and in, in a very similar way um let me ask you about what we've been calling at least in the united states the quote-unquote interim government which is always what coup governments are called to imply that they're sort of benignly caretakers of of the democracy until elections that are legitimate can be held um, so far, this quote unquote interim government uh, is is 10 months old. Um, what can you tell us about this once obscure senator, uh, Janine Nanez, uh, who, who is now the interim president uh, and the faction and, and the ideology that she represents? What is it uh, that are the, is their real agenda in having seized power in the way that they did? Well, I think that the real agenda is revenge. I think that the idea is to punish, to undo, uh, to destroy, uh, and to, to imprison Morales officials and, and, and that legacy. And, and I think their critique of the flaws with the Morales administration are not the same as the actual flaws that existed. I think she was chosen kind of as a patsy uh, only her party only received four percent of the vote in the last elections, and there was this really sketchy meeting with some political representatives and the Catholic Church and different ambassadors, where they all decided, okay, she has a minor role in the Senate board. We'll get her to do it, and they slid in and called this congressional sec session in the Senate with no quorum as she proclaimed herself. It was all very quickly done and the Bolivian Constitutional Tribunal rubber stamped it with a press release and then the international community celebrated an, an end to the conflict and an end to the crisis when really this was just the very beginning. I mean, we talk about a coup forcing Morales to leave, to leave but we have a coup that keeps evolving and developing and in an effort to impede democratic elections in an effort to disqualify 
the Moss Party that's currently polling first in the polls. So, you know, you have a person who is ill-prepared for governance. You have a person whose social media accounts, although they were erased, expressed extremely racist views about uh, indigenous ceremonies being satanic rituals, making fun of indigenous people wearing shoes, calling Morales a dictator. You know, this is a really grossly offensive racist agenda and uh, and a pseudo evangelical agenda that dovetailed nicely with the priorities of the elite and the armed forces and the police who had carried out these racist acts during the violence surrounding Morales's resignation. It all dovetailed nicely and I think she was kind of viewed as a, a placeholder uh, for the rest of the right to kind of get ready for elections. But, you know, she got a big head. They began to repress and there weren't the consequences or the pushback from the international community that there should have been. And a gr great deal of silence on the part of most of the international press and the Bolivian press that things just snowballed. And she began to become an entity on her own with, with a very repressive presence and, and two massacres under their belt. Yeah. Um, so leaving aside the fact that she's by definition illegitimate, given that she wasn't elected and worse than that, her party, as you said, received a trivial percentage of the vote. There's an even uglier faction, it seems, at least more overtly racist, more overtly nationalistic and anti-indigenous uh, figures like Luis Fernando Camacho, who hail from the same sort of political tradition and culture and region um, and 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 uh, faction. Um, but it seems like there's been at least an attempt to suggest anyway that she's now kind of a more moderate figure, that there's conflict between her and the interests that she represents and these more frightening figures like Camacho and these even further right wing, you could really have to call them fascists, who might be poised to take over if she doesn't continue to remain in power. Is this conflict real between what we have to call the interim president or is this just a facade to create a more moderate and tolerable image for her than the reality ought to suggest? It, it's my assessment that there are there is internal competition between the two, but I don't see that their political agendas or their visions or their perspectives are, are very different. I think there was an idea that to put a feminine face on it, she's always made up, she's maternal, she does campaign ads doing housework. But in the end, what's my understanding is they were going to see who ended up in the polls. And if she was going to be the better candidate, then he was going to become the governor of Santa Cruz. I really think they were all poised to go behind Camacho. And they sent the, him on the United, to the United States as kind of a, a test drive to see how he would play in the U.S. market. And I think he got a two thumbs down as a little too blatantly fascist. I think, you know, the videos, for example, of the Youth League that he rose up from and the Nazi salute that they use was problematic in the United States. But yeah, I the, think West, the West likes a little bit of a more subtle, a little more prettified face on that ideology, which they're fine with. But the style definitely seemed a little more blunt than is generally desirable. Yeah, it's his Ukrainian mercenary bodyguards, for yeah. example, were rather conflictive. So I think they wanted a, 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 a kinder, gentler form of extreme authoritarianism and racism, or at least that is my perception after he returned from the United States, that the tides kind of shifted and the focus was more on Anya's Fortune magazine, a wonderful woman president. They then highlighted her as, you know, the key, uh, one of the key women leaders dealing with the pandemic. But in reality, her policy and the vision of Camacho, beyond a whole lot of mascara and some public relations, is really not very different. We're talking about a woman who came into power uh, on the 12th of November and two days later signed a supreme decree 
basically authorizing uh, impunity for the military and the police for gross human rights violations, something that violates every international human rights agreement. And then the next day, the military began pumping bullets, uh, first in Sakaba into Abel Morales' support base, the, the Japari coca growers, and 10 people ended up uh, killed there. So it's not that she's a softer or a better person, it's that the news didn't get out. And there was even on the part of, I think, more progressive members of the international community, a vision that because they had already backed her, the cognitive dissonance was too much. But you have the day after she takes power, her minister saying they're going after seditious journalists, that coca growers are narco-terrorists and drug traffickers, that they were going to eliminate dangerous Foreigners, you go down the early warning signs of fascism, and we have a tick, 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 tick. And, and this continued. Three days later, another massacre. The political perse persecution, the levels, the, the, the images of the military and the police high command standing behind them, the arbitrary arrests of judges, of MAS members, of even the babysitters of former MAS officials. This is not much different than the vision of what we would get with a Camacho. I, I, I don't think we're better off with her. Yeah, I think it's a really fascinating and vivid example of the utility that a lot of malicious institutions find now in this kind of very superficial diversity politics that if you can put a female face on a highly repressive government, it seems more friendly, more media presentable. If, for example, the CIA celebrates Women's Day or the GCHQ bathes itself in the rainbow flag and celebrates its gay code breakers, we're supposed to think better of those institutions and forget about the violence and coups that they're carrying out. I think this very much... Uh, at play in, in how this interim government has been perceived. Um, these massacres that you reference of, of moral, Morales protesters, of, of indigenous protesters in the wake of the coup, did receive some international attention. It was in November prior to the, to the, to the outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic. Since then, there's been very little international attention paid to the internal domestic uh, state of, of political liberties, in Bolivia, it was announced there'd be a new election that was then canceled in the name of the virus. Um, I think there's a new election scheduled now, which I want to ask you uh, about in, in a moment. But since those really violent, savage criminal massacres that took place early on when she assumed the interim presidency, how would you describe the nature of political rights, political repression, civil liberties in Bolivia as compared to what it was like uh, prior to the removal of Morales? I, I think it's important to note that with these massacres and with the appearance of the Inter-American Human Rights Commission, the military and the police found out that they could have consequences for killing people, and they stopped. But that doesn't mean that the human rights violations stopped. It doesn't mean that there's any respect for due process or for indigenous rights. You know, after the massacre, when we interviewed the, the victims and their families, they consistently say, you know, we, had, we lost our rights in one 24-hour period. But we know the law and we know that this is wrong and we can't put up with this forever. They were killing us like dogs. I was... 20 people must have told us the, the night of the massacre. So we have less direct violence, but we have persecution with cyber patrols. You're arrested for sedition and terrorism on hearsay evidence, for having a megaphone, for uh, social protest has been completely criminalized. You have long-term incarceration in the face of, of a pandemic and a prison pardon that hasn't been applied. You have soaring violations of privacy. You have strengthening and uh, channeling of huge amounts of money to the armed forces and an armed forces that with the permission of Agnes promoted itself in violation of the constitution and 
without the approval of the Bolivian Senate, while they threatened to throw the head of the Senate in, in prison. So we have a, a situation of persistent political persecution, gross human rights violations, no due process, no freedom of the press, very little accurate reporting, harassment of journalists, harassment of uh, social movement leaders, stigmatization of coca growers. It's very much like going back in time, either to the 90s with the Chapari coca growing region where Abel Morales gained prominence or, or back to the, the period of the dictatorship. But it, there's a certain feeling of, at the, in the 90s, there were some rules and there were lines that could be crossed and there would eventually be pushback or retreat. And there's not that perception now. And so, you know, there's a push to take away Moss's right to party, trumped up charges against uh, most of the Moss candidates and in a position where, you know, we just can't wait any longer for elections. We, the, the stipend was given to some Bolivian families uh, for, for six months, $73. No one can live on that. And most of the population here is day-to-day -day living. So let me ask you about those elections, um, because what you describe is a very systemic, sustained, pervasive effort to destroy civic society, to destroy political rights. It certainly looks like the interim government and the forces behind it, including the military and industrial interests, don't really have much of an intention of leaving anytime soon. And they're taking one step after the next to further entrench their power. At the same time, as you say, polling data from what I've seen at least, uniformly shows that Morales' party, the movement towards socialism, or MAS, continues to lead um, in presidential polls. It's still the most popular party, even with Morales gone. So given that, it seems very unlikely that all of that violence and repression and undoing of the democratic order is being done simply to just let go of power once there's an election and okay, we lost fair and square and, and goodbye. So how confident are you that there's actually going to be an election this time as scheduled? And if there is one, how confident are you that it will actually be free and fair? I, I think it's hard to say. I mean, this government came in and there was no grace period. There weren't three days of going slowly. They have replaced everyone in all the government offices. They have restructured everything. They have written a new five-year drug strategy, which somehow garnered the support of the European Union, although it violates all of the European Union's policies. It has the support of the Trump administration, although they lie about how much funding they get. And you have a caterer of, of journalists, of Bolivian journalists, who have received a great deal of funding from the U.S. National Endowment of democracy and other U.S. funding areas where they, they don't speak out against the coup and they don't speak out against these violations. So we're at a situation where the Agnes administration now knows that they, they probably aren't going to win, at least not uh, unilaterally. Um, they complain about the head of the electoral tribunal, but Anya has herself appointed him. I don't know how she can run because that's a clear uh, conflict of interest. But I think they know they can't stay. And if they have to leave, they're going to have to leave the country. So my perception right now is as hundreds of millions of dollars of international aid flood into Bolivia for the COVID uh, pandemic, is that they're really saving up for an earlier retirement. And I don't know if they'll be in Boca Raton or they'll be your neighbors in Brazil because it's a very sympathetic government. But I think there's going to be a point in time if they if elections do come and they can't take power, if Moss comes in, they're going to have to bail. And the people who are left here, including the military and police high command, are going to face charges. And that means that there's a real nasty symbiotic relationship with the high command of those forces and really dead set on engaging in impunity. What happens from here on out? 
It's very hard to say. There's a pushback to avoid September 6th elections. All parties except Camacho and Añez had agreed. Now all parties except for Moss have backtracked. You have Carlos Mesa as this kind of very malleable, supposedly middle of the road candidate, but who always throws his votes or his support to the far right. You know, he allowed, uh, he denounced the massacre in 2003, but this time he didn't think massacres were a problem. And so uh, we don't know what's going to happen. Are the elections going to be fair and free? Is there going to be voter suppression? They're threatening candidates consistently. Uh, a Cochabamba Senate alternate is in jail in La Paz for, for terrorism. The, you know, with charges of terrorism, Patricia Arce, who I think you know about, was the mayor of Vinto and then illegitimately arrested, just had her four dogs poisoned as a threat. So this harassment of candidates and voters continues. Where does that lead us with an international community that so far has been mute? That, that's a big issue, and I think that should be a concern we're all paying attention to. So, so let me ask you about the, the international community. Um, it's obviously no secret that throughout the Cold War, the West, led by the United States, had a huge interest in Latin America, toppled democratically elected governments when they even mildly disliked them, thought they were a little bit leaning left, by no means even necessarily communist. Um, and as, a, as many atrocities as were committed— as part of that agenda, at least it had a rational framework, which was there was a global competition between the Soviet Union on the one hand, the United States on the other, and all of that was viewed as proxy wars over who had the most influence. Now that there's no more Soviet Union, one of the things that we continue to see that I think is hard to understand is that oftentimes the U.S. continues to involve itself directly and interfere in the domestic affairs of governments in Latin America, whether it be Honduras or whether it be Brazil, or whether it be Bolivia, um, leaving the question as to why. Why did Mike Pompeo immediately cheer the coup in Bolivia? Why did so many leading U.S. foreign policy writers across the political spectrum, not just on the right or even the think tank center, but also on the progressive left, declare that Evo Morales himself was an enemy of democracy? When I asked President Morales about that, why do, what does the West have against you? You seem to get along more or less with the international community. He pointed to several factors, the principal one of which was lithium, which obviously Bolivia is quite rich in and is growing in importance because of its use for electric cars and the competition with China over its control. Do you agree that that is the principal impetus for why the international community it seems to be supportive of um, the military coup, or at least tolerant of it, or are there other reasons for that? I, I would say that it's much more complex, or at least my analysis. One, I would say that the Cold War in Latin America was replaced almost immediately afterwards by the drug war, which gave the U.S. a very violent and repressive means of continuing to intervene. And this is really, I mean, Abel Morales has often said, you know, the U.S. is my campaign manager because he rose to prominence with that U the U.S. pressure. And I, th I think that there's a real issue because Bolivia was the country most dependent on U.S. economic aid, and that's all narcoticized with the uh, certification system. But the idea that Bolivia could kick out the U.S. ambassador, could kick out the Drug Enforcement Administration, could kick out USAID, and U.S. funding went away, the U.S. decertified Bolivia, but yet Bolivia developed its own way to control coca, had a credible way to attack the drug trade, which, you, of course, you can't end, but to protect the population. Uh, the ec economy of Bolivia improved. It, I mean, really, the emperor had no clothes. Once the U.S. support was gone, it, it was a clear example of that you, you could do things without the U.S. and you could defy the U.S. and still be a success. I think that's a very painful message for the United States foreign policy ego, which is huge. And I'm very surprised that other Latin American countries or that the other coca-producing countries haven't really grasped 
that issue. So there's an offense there, and there's the threat of a good example. And I think that there was a very uh, marked desire to overthrow or overturn or to debunk that. And you had an elite that was largely living in the United States and over a 14-year period would engage constantly with the international community because they had nothing else to do. I mean, the, the Morales vision of internally focused and internally defined politics without cutting off other nations meant that his diplomats didn't fawn all over members of the international community. And a lot of that is ego. And, and that was painful. And, and the economic... Uh, independence of Bolivia was painful. And so you see this whole move of what middle of the road uh, diplomats in the United States or, or uh, policymakers thought was this very rational English speaking Bolivian ousted political elite that could engage with them. And I don't know, they could play golf together. Uh, compared and, to and be this. more deferential, right? And be more, I, be more deferential. You know, I, I, I remember I, I interviewed uh, former President uh, Correa of Ecuador, um, and I asked him about one of the things that he did early on, which was there was a military base in Ecuador, and, and he demanded that that military base leave uh, the sovereign soil of Ecuador. And it was a huge uproar in the United States, and he finally said, look, I'm happy to have you have a military base in Ecuador if we, Ecuador, can put a military base in Miami. And I remember the American commentariat and the diplomatic corps acting as though that was something somebody only in an insane asylum would say, the idea that there ought to be reciprocity between the U.S. and a Latin American country, or there ought to be any kind of sovereignty or independence asserted, is something that to this very day, even with the Cold War gone, provokes genuine indignation because of how American exceptionalism and the Monroe Doctrine is so ingrained in in U.S. elites. And it does seem clear that uh, President Morales is doing things like expelling a diplomat that he suspected of spying and just generally asserting the right to have the basic elements of sovereignty was at least um, part of the picture. Um, l let me ask you about the two principal, you could call them pretexts, um, used to justify ordering Morales out of Ecuador, out, out of Bolivia, and, and invalidating the election or declaring it invalid, or two criticisms that were voiced in the international community. One was the report by the Organization of American States alleging irregularities and fraud, a report that has been repeatedly debunked by neutral observers in a way that even the New York Times recognized was no longer reliable, even though their own reporting repeatedly incited it uncritically as as truth. Um, and as I indicated to you, we have Mark Weisbrot on the show, whose organization was the first to really demonstrate the flawed analysis on which that OAS report relied to make those conclusions. But there's a second criticism that I'd like to ask you about um, that I hear all the time whenever I talk about Bolivia, which is the idea of term limits, that the Bolivian constitution explicitly says that a president shall be confined only the two term limits. When Morales sought his third term limit, the argument was, well, the first one doesn't really count because that limitation wasn't in place at the time and everyone sort of said all right give evo a third term and and that's it um and then he went and sought a fourth term which even his close ally in brazil lula da silva said was a mistake there's a court decision saying it was invalidated the claim is that the court was just packed by morales loyalists and the decision had no legal basis what do you make of that criticism? Is there political validity to it? Is there legal validity to it? When I asked Morales about it, he said, other world leaders have been in office for longer than I have, like Angela Merkel, and nobody seems to be bothered by that. Um, and that Brazil, that Bolivia never had the stability that I've brought it. Um, and the court ruled legitimately. So how do you kind of sort through the, the debate around that criticism? I think it's important to note, and one of the things that I just wanted to point out quickly about the kind of Trump affinity and with with the right here is this environment in which the elections happened. 
and it's fake news and attacks and WhatsApp messages and bots on Twitter and this churning of a reputation and the vision that there was was going to be electoral fraud you know, starting eight months in front of the elections. Uh, and and this kind of being set in everyone's mind that created this susceptibility and this technical glitch that caused the problem. But at the same time, Morales agreed to the audit. He complied by the audit and did everything the opposition asked for. And they still tortured his members and threatened him and violently pushed him out. So there are illegitimate things on very, very many levels. Even the Bolivian prosecutor's special investigation on fraud found errors in the OAS report. But in the other issue of fourth term, I think the fourth term was problematic. I think that there was a vision probably on the part of MAS policymakers that they saw, for example, what happened in Ecuador when uh, Correa uh, passed on the candidacy to a successor and then the policies were very, very different and the rise of right-wing governments in other areas of Latin America, that there was this vision that they couldn't give that up by putting in a new candidate. According to the constitution, they wrote themselves and passed by a majority, that wasn't okay. So I think it was a strategic error the fourth term. I think that Morales lost a lot of legitimacy. There were many arguments for continuity, but I don't think that strategically that fourth run was helpful. I think if Moss had run someone different, um, that they probably still would have won. But I get very irritated with this external vision of, well, Morales never named a successor. No one names a successor. Donald Trump hasn't named a successor. Barack Nor has Obama Angela Merkel. There's no successor to Angela Merkel in Germany, for example. No, I mean, I mean, there's this whole kind of vision of rules. That or, to, or, or, or to Bibi Netanyahu, who also has been in office longer than, than Morales was that nobody seems to mind. Well, the yardstick is sliding and convenient and flops all over the place. But, you know, we have, so we have this situation where the fourth term also uh, caused a lot of friction internally. But I'm tired of hearing people in the international community. And they said for months, all of this is Abel Morales' fault. Well, Abel Morales left the country on November 10th. And since then... This interim illegitimate government is responsible for all the horrific things they've done because it's been their choice, and that's not on Ava Morales' shoulders. And it's really time that they be held accountable by, by international human rights standards. And so you have a whole slew of international human rights reports that are coming out but haven't come out. But any denunciation of violations by any international organization is, is, is pushed back and insulted and attacked by this government. There are just no rules for them. And this is, this is completely illegitimate and inappropriate and very, very dangerous. So let me uh, conclude with, as, as the last question with a question that's a little bit personal, although quite political as well. Um, as somebody who has lived in a foreign country other than the one that in which I was born, which is Brazil, for 15 years now and does a lot of work journalistically and on its politics, uh, I think it's something that you do, namely live in a country for that long and are that passionate about its politics only if you come to really love the country, to see really – unique attributes and qualities to it that make it worth fighting for that make what happens to it politically and 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 the welfare of its people something truly important not just for the country but for the region and for the world you're somebody who's lived in bolivia for twice as long as i've lived in brazil um i can tell just from this first conversation that we've had that you have a very deep and abiding passion for Bolivia, Bolivians, Bolivia politics, Bolivia, Bolivian culture. What is it about Bolivia that has made you fall in love with it, that makes you view it as something politically and culturally unique, and, and that makes you so concerned about it, its well-being? Well, you know, I've lived here longer than I've lived anywhere else. And when I arrived here, it was a huge adjustment. 
But the ability to see these these grassroots movements, and you know, my my main work has always been with coca growers and coca growing women and protests and strong, dedicated work, you know, to reach goals, to work for their families, to gain recognition, to gain power, in a sense. It's something that's very unique and very special, this, this ability of, you know, really that, that, that colonization and a kind of imperialist imposition hasn't been able to erode strong community ties. They've evolved, they've grown, they're different. But I just real, I really feel that, that that's where the power and the structure in Bolivia comes from. And I'm not part of that, but I'm allowed to share that. And I felt um, happy to be able to try to translate that or communicate that and to kind of communicate a reality that gets washed over or washed away in translation to really make those voices heard. And I, and I, and I feel, uh, I feel very privileged to be able to do that and to be able to share with those people. Well, listen, I, I, um, think that the coup itself has, was obviously, a disgrace, but it's also, I think, been somewhat disgraceful how the world, notwithstanding the understandable fixation on the pandemic and other crises, has sort of just completely averted its eyes to the aftermath, allowing the Bolivian government, the interim illegitimate Bolivian government, to become even more repressive. And I think given the involvement of the West and everything that's happened, the responsibility it has for the region, um, that its entitlement to continue to ignore the aftermath has ended, which is why we decided to devote our entire show to what's happening in, in Bolivia and your contributions and, and you're taking the time to talk to me has been incredibly uh, invaluable. To share my concerns and views and, and, and exchange ideas. I appreciate that so much. Okay, great. It was fantastic talking to you. Take it easy. Take care of yourself. You too. Joining me now to explore the questions surrounding the 2019 coup in Bolivia, the U.S. role in it, and the ongoing aftermath of it is one of the leading experts in U.S. policy in Latin America and in a variety of countries in that region, including Brazil and Bolivia. He's the economist Mike Weisbrot, who's also the co-director of the Center for Economic and Policy Research. Mark, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Glenn. Thanks for inviting me. Sure. So we've been wanting to do a show about the uh, ongoing coup in Bolivia because back in November or October when it happened, the idea was, oh, don't worry, it's just an interim government as we always hear after coups. There'll be elections very shortly. Democracy will be restored. And of course, here we are um, close to a year later, nine months, 10 months. And the quote unquote interim government still has a stranglehold on power. But as we were putting the show together, one of the questions that I had and that I want to pose to you is that with Americans facing so many grave crises at the moment, obviously the coronavirus pandemic that has upended everyone's lives, the economic crisis that is increasingly severe and that is accompanied by it, as well as the ongoing protest movement over racist police abuses. Why is it that Americans should create the space and the time to think about and, and care about what was done in Bolivia and what continues to be done to that country? Well, I think it's really important for the hemisphere and the world if the United States can sponsor basically a coup against a democratically elected government. And there's no dispute, by the way, that Evo Morales was democratically elected in 2014. And he still had some months left in his term when the military uh, forced him out of office on November 10th. And if that can happen, and the media ignored it until very recently, actually, in the last month, there's been some change in, in the New York Times reporting, but it just everyone kind of went along with it. Uh, 
And that's a, an enormous uh, setback. I mean, that sets us back decades in terms of democracy, just basic democratic rights in Latin America, not to mention that they've thrown all these people in jail. There's been massacres by police. And, you know, you do have, I mean, Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch and the, uh, you know, the uh, OAS uh, Commission on Human Rights have all, uh, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, they've all said things about it, but you can see there's almost, there's hardly anything in the media about it at all. So, you know, one of the things, let's talk about the central figure in all of this who who is Evo Morales. Uh, who served three terms as as president of Bolivia, a country that had almost no stability of any kind, let alone that level of stability prior to his three election victories and then his fourth that he didn't have the opportunity to serve. Um, I, I traveled to Mexico City where he was at the time in exile, where he had received asylum. He's now in Argentina in December, so about a month after he was forced by the military and the police under threat to leave Bolivia to interview him. And one of the things that really struck me about having spent that much time with him is that whatever you think of his ideology, whatever you think of his politics, he's an incredibly insightful uh, political leader who has seen so much. I mean, he, he, you know, presided over a country during three different U S administrations, Bush, Obama, in Trump, he's been in the middle of uh, this region, and most remarkably, uh, despite the perception that he's this kind of dogmatic socialist, Bolivia has experienced the kind of successes that even the you know neoliberal outlets like the Economist and the metrics that they use uh, recognize his governance as having been a success, and yet we almost never hear from Evo Morales. I can't. I can't even count on one hand the the time, the number of times that I think in the West we've heard from him or much about him other than caricatures of him being one of these, you know, kind of throwback socialist leaders crushing dissent and uh, starving his people and the like. Talk about, if you could, the reality of Eva Morales, his governance and, and what makes him such an important figure for the region generally and for Bolivia specifically. Sure. Well, first of all, it's got the, you know, Bolivia has the largest indigenous uh, population as percent of population in the Americas. And so he was the first indigenous uh, president and the first one really uh, for, you know, probably a century in, in the Americas. And uh, and so that was a, a major thing. And there's a lot of racism involved in this as well, as you can imagine. The coup leaders uh, have, you know, been racist and they're trying to restore a kind of a minority rule that uh, was overturned with the election of Evo Morales. But the, you know, economically too, uh, and you're right, it wasn't even the IMF has recognized the success of uh, the government in terms of becoming one of the fastest, uh, the fastest growing economy in South America in terms of poverty reduction, um, in terms of lowering the retirement age when, you know, everywhere else they're raising it, uh, public pensions, uh, spending on uh, on health care and public investment. So there was so much, uh, there was quite a transformation and that's why uh, he remains popular and actually uh, won this election with about uh, 40 seven uh, percent of the vote and you know even the ones who are disputing the election they're not disputing that he got somewhere around there it's really a maybe less than a percentage point that they're trying to uh say that on that basis that he's uh, stole the election and i think that's the most outrageous uh, thing of all is because you know this was done and this is why i think people don't know about it you know it isn't just that there's covid and all these other distractions i mean this happened November 10th was the coup last year. And and here it was, the OAS was used to create a false narrative from the day after the coup, so, uh, the day after the election. So the election was uh, uh, October uh, 20th. So if, 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 I could just, if I could just interrupt you for, for a second, because I, I actually want to delve deeply into the 
OAS because it was actually your organization that played, in my view, the key role in debunking the claims of the OAS that the election was fraudulent and his victory was the byproduct of irregularities and fraud. So just before we get into that in in the detail, I just want to ask one more question about Morales himself and the perception of him in the West and, and, and the fact that the OAS was obviously hostile toward him. I, you know, I, in, in 2019, I, I went and I interviewed former president Lula da Silva in Brazil. And, and at the time he was still in, in a prison cell in Curitiba. And one of the questions that I asked him, because he kept saying, you know, the oligarchical class of Brazil hates me, was waging war on me. They were backed by a international capital. And one of the amazing things about Lula's governance, similar to what we just talked about Morales, is that despite the perception for a long time of Lula as this dogmatic communist and labor leader and hardcore socialist, his governance was, you could almost call it neoliberal in the sense that he definitely did a lot to distribute wealth more equitably and help millions of people out of poverty. But at the same time, the richest sectors in Brazil thrived under Lula. The rich got richer. Um, economic growth obviously helped the upper class, the, 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 the bankers, the industrial sector. And so I asked him, given how well they did under your presidency, why did they harbor such hostility toward you? And it's the same question I have for Morales, who wasn't nationalizing everything and kicking the West out of everything and turning everything over to the population, kind of hardcore dogmatic communism. It was a much softer form of socialism that both appeased international markets and, and fostered economic growth, like I said, of the kind The Economist likes, like Lula did, while simply reducing the traditional harsh, brutal inequality that the country has long suffered. So why is there so much animus among these white, rich factions in Brazil or Bolivia, and then more broadly in the West toward leaders who nonetheless create successes by these economic metrics? Yeah, this is a great question. I mean, you could ask that about, uh, you know, almost any of the countries where the United States did succeed in getting rid of left governments even, uh, temporarily as in Argentina, but also in um, in Honduras, in uh, in in uh, Ecuador, in Bolivia. So it, it is different. I mean, obviously, it's a different answer in in each country, because uh, the first of all, the traditional elite in each country is different and has different reasons. I, I think uh, for wanting to remain in power, I, I think a lot of it is really just power. They don't run the country and. In Bolivia, they kind of accepted it some at first uh, because it was something like South Africa where they realized it was at least a part of the elite, even some of the people who supported this coup at the time uh, when Evo was elected realized they couldn't uh, run a, uh, a country that had, you know, almost the majority of uh, indigenous people without them having any representation in, in the government. And so it was a little different than some of the other uh, countries where the left took power and it was much more of a class uh, distinction and it wasn't as obvious to them as it was in the case of uh, Bolivia. But I think it's it's power. They want to be in power. And, you know, if you took the U.S. out of the equation in Bolivia and, and maybe even Brazil, too, I mean, the U.S., as you know, had a, a, a role there as well. Uh, you you might not have you you, know, you might have had an accommodation. You're right that these are not radical. These are basically uh, social uh, democratic uh, governments. And yes, it's true that in in Brazil and Bolivia the rich uh, still did well. But the there, the big difference was that the poor got something as well and and much more uh, than they got in the past in both of those countries. And so it's it's a lot of it is about power. And if you have this country that's the most powerful country in the world uh, is backing you and telling you uh, constantly uh, that you can come back and you don't have to respect the results of democratic elections, 
it makes an enormous difference. It's by no means the whole story. I mean, it wasn't the whole story in Chile in 1973 either uh, when the U.S. supported that coup. You know, it was still uh, primarily uh, the result of uh, an internal uh, conflict. But nonetheless, it does make an enormous uh, difference. And uh, this time, as, as you know, we were getting to before, they were able to use the, the OAS, and I think that made a big difference as well. So, yeah, so let's talk about that. And just, but, but just let me say, you know, I, I posed that question, that same question, both to Lula and Morales, and they had very similar answers, which is they said, yes, it's true. The rich did really well under our governance, but they still hated us not for economic reasons, but cultural reasons, because while they were doing well, as you just said, the poor people in the country, the indigenous in Bolivia, the black people in Brazil also started doing well. And so for the first time you were seeing black Brazilians in airports and shopping malls or indigenous people being able to open businesses. And it just felt like a loss of cultural entitlement. So it was more cultural, almost this resentment than it was economic. So let's talk now about the Organization of American States because it did play, in my view, I don't think it's controversial, the key role in enabling the coup that resulted in the removal of Eva Morales, not just from the presidency that he had just been elected to, but also the country um, that he had governed for 12 years because the OAS quickly issued a report essentially purporting to prove systemic fraud and irregularities, implying not that he didn't get the most votes, but as you said earlier, that he fell shy of the 10 point margin needed to avoid a runoff. And it was those allegations of fraud that then justified the military and the police and these right wing factions seizing control and saying it's time for him to go. And one of the things that I find so interesting is your organization the CEPR quickly issued a preliminary report vehemently disputing and contesting the OAS's allegations of fraud. And then shortly thereafter issued a more comprehensive analysis, definitively proving that the OAS analysis was itself utterly fraudulent. Talk a little bit, if you would, about what the real role of the OAS is in, in Latin America, because obviously the perception is it's a regional alliance that is there to be a kind of neutral arbiter of free and fair elections. And how it, how is it that your organization was able so quickly to recognize the analytical flaws, the profound analytical flaws that now everyone admits pervaded that OAS report? Yeah, well, they issued their first press statement on the 21st of October, the day after the election. The votes weren't even completely counted yet. And uh, they said that there was a, um, a change in the trend of, a disturbing change in the trend of, of the vote. Um, and they didn't offer any evidence uh, whatsoever. They, they, the press release said there was deep concern and surprise at the drastic and hard to explain change in the trend of the pre preliminary results after the closing of the polls. That was their statement. And this is really, was really quite outrageous because there, there was no such thing. And in fact... Well, and, uh, and also, how, how often does that happen in the U.S. where election results come in, a candidate has a 20-point lead because all the precincts favorable to that candidate are the ones reported first, and then suddenly the stronghold of their opponent comes in and everything radically changes. That's how elections typically function, right? There's nothing irregular about that. That's exactly what happened, and I think they must have, have known it too. And what's really deceptive about the whole thing, so they made that statement, they offered no evidence at all, and then we just looked at the data that was publicly available on their website, and you could see that just what you described uh, is what happened. And in fact, 133 economists and statisticians wrote a letter to The Guardian uh, in November saying, uh, you know, that this is, it was comparing it to the governor's election in Louisiana, the United States. Anybody who has ever watched an election return on CNN uh, would eventually have that experience of seeing an election change because the, uh, you know, as the night goes on and the results come in, because uh, the later uh, 
areas and in the, in the, often happens uh, you know in, in, in a lot of countries because they come in later either because they're poor they're rural whatever it is they come which in are later. which are which are uh, evo strongholds right the the yeah, the, the yeah. kind of outlying areas the poor areas the indigenous areas and here's the thing is the oas did five statements and reports you know each one getting longer towards the end, and never even considered this possibility. Now, is it really possible that they're stupider than, you know, an average person who watches a lecture and returns? I don't really think so. I think they knew that it was false, uh, you know, all along. And they had to have looked at that. And they never mentioned it. And they never did. And then what they finally did when, you know, uh, you know, last month, the New York Times finally published a report that contradicted their previous eight months of reporting, which just gave the OAS uh, interpretation of events. They published a report of a, on a statistical study uh, showing that, in fact, the OAS was wrong. And uh, so then they said, well, oh, you know, that doesn't matter. Uh, because we don't care about the statistical study. We have other things, and they point to other irregularities in the election. And this was garbage as well. And we did an 82-page report on that, uh, their allegations of irregularities in the election. All elections have irregularities. You know, I just voted in an election here in D.C. Uh, a month ago, and I got two uh, ballots in the mail. I could have voted twice, and I didn't. But that happens, okay? And that's the kind of things they have in this re in their report, you know, that, for example, in areas where, uh, you know, literacy was low, you had maybe one person signed off on a bunch of, which was actually legal. Uh, it was legal for them to do so. You know, signed off on a bunch of the octas on the tally sheets. And so they, they pointed to things like that, and they never even alleged that any of this changed the results of the election. And of course, there are regular, there's irregularities in every election. So that's what they fell back to after they couldn't show, uh, you know, after their statistical analysis, which was false from day one, was finally shown. And you didn't need, by the way, you know, we did several statistical analyses as well, and so did the elections lab at uh, Massachusetts Institute for Technology. And, you know, uh, you didn't even need it because it was that simple. And as I show, you know, several times, and we all did, uh, you, you really just needed eighth grade arithmetic from the beginning to show that their report was false. And this is a real problem. I, I, the reason I'm wasting all your time with this is that you go to Congress, which we've done, and in fact, uh, uh, four members of Congress sent a letter to the OAS and asked them 11 questions about their report, and they never answered. And, you know, uh, but you go to Congress and you go to people who have uh, the, they have the Congress, U.S. Congress supplies 60% of their budget. They have real leverage here. And they think that the OAS is just this neutral organization that wouldn't do something like that. It's a terrible naivete. And if you look at the OAS history, in fact, and you, you know this, in, in Haiti, they uh, in 2011 they reversed the results of, a, of an election without even doing a statistical analysis at all or a recount or anything and they just changed it for political reasons and in 2000 they also did the same thing in haiti and that one was very much like this because it led to a coup in 2004 in other words they changed their report on the 2000 election in haiti and that was used by the u.s government to cut off all a aid to Haiti for four years, international aid, which they couldn't live without, and then overthrow the government in, in, in uh, you know, in broad daylight uh, in 2004. And, you know, that's why I'm emphasizing all of this, because, you know, the Washington Post has this motto, democracy uh, dies in darkness. Democracy dies in broad daylight. That's what's happening right now in Bolivia. That's what's happening in Ecuador. And as you have reported extensively, that's what's happened in Brazil. And you, you know, Brazil, at least you got a little coverage of it, but the other countries, you know, they don't, it's barely even mentioned. 
Yeah, you know, one of the things that, that struck me so much about this whole episode and, and the reason I continue to find it so important to dig into and, and to understand is living in Brazil or living in a foreign country always gives you a much clearer idea of how propaganda works in the country that you used to live in from which you're now distant. And one of the things that's amazing is if you mention the OAS to anybody in Latin America, here in Brazil, if you mention the OAS, nobody thinks the OAS is a credible institution. Everybody knows that it's a tool of U.S. imperial power, that it's an arm of uh, international capital to control Latin America, the Latin American region. That's just the perception that it has because that's its reality. And it, here in the U.S., it's amazing to have watched the minute the OAS report came out for it to be treated as gospel, not only by the New York Times, but an entire broad range of U.S. commentators, some of whom are foreign policy specialists, others of whom are just people who spout off across the political spectrum from the left to the right saying, ah, oh, looks like Evo Morales was attacking democracy and thankfully the Bolivian military saved it without having the slightest idea that there's even a debate about the OAS that exists in the world. That's how propagandized they are. And the other part of it that, that was so amazing to me is you want to talk about irregularities in elections. In California, three months ago, there was a primary, a Democratic Party primary, and we didn't know the results of that primary until three months after the count was held, which has become incredibly common in the United States where we don't learn even in presidential elections what the final count is until weeks or months later. And there's no sense that, well, maybe a 12-hour delay in the account in Bolivia isn't really such a remarkable indicia of corruption and irregularity given how we compare, how, how we conduct our own elections. Um, but let me ask you about that because... I think people do have a, a kind of question. Obviously, during the Cold War, the motive for U.S. interference and coups and propping up of dictators and, and the like was well known, which was this global competition with the Soviet Union over dominance. There's no more Cold War. Why is it? First of all, what do we know about the U.S. role in the coup in Bolivia? We know that Mike Pompeo applauded it and cheered it and, and, and endorsed it. But what do we know about the participation of anything? And what motive would the U.S. have for wanting Eva Morales replaced by this hardcore right wing minority white descendant Christian faction that is now running Bolivia? Well, um, I guess, you know, you have Trump, <laughs> Pompeo, and, it, you know, we don't know what they did in terms of actual logistical support or anything like that. All we know right now is that they definitely supported the coup uh, immediately uh, when it happened. And, and, tr and Pompeo actually did have tweets uh, kind of uh, calling on the OAS to do something. Uh, when there was the interruption in the preliminary vote count, which is, by the way, not even a binding count, and it, it, it really didn't matter at all, and it was just an interruption. But uh, So they went for that. It was kind of a crime of opportunity, too, to some degree, because they had these optics that they thought were favorable to them. But what do they want? Uh, well, I mean, they, you know, U.S. policy in Latin America was remarkably continuous from the George W. Bush uh, to through the Obama administration. Now, it is a little worse. I mean, it's significantly worse under Trump in that it's, they're more uh, more violently uh, committed. There's some, by the way, there's a there's some pushback in the U.S. Congress uh, on that. And th there was always some, you know, dissent here, but uh, never enough. So why are they doing it? I think that uh, they, you know, some of it, is just for Obama, it was mostly he didn't care. And so you have 17 intelligence agencies and the State Department and the Pentagon and the foreign policy committees of Congress. And so this is a kind of a permanent government on foreign policy and especially on Latin America, because Latin America is, is worse. You know, as you, you mentioned, the media coverage, but, you know, it, the media coverage is worse on Latin America probably than most any region in the world in the U.S. And, and that's because there's very little dissent. 
within these uh, so-called national security state. You know, you have differences of opinion on Afghanistan and Iraq and even Israel-Palestine that go back for a long time. And on Latin America, it really is a kind of monolithic. They see it, the people who are making these decisions in all of these various parts of the so-called national security state, they see this as our region and, uh, and that we in the United States uh, get to determine who can serve as president. And, and, and that's, that's how they look at it. And so, uh, and, and there is a, a potential domino effect when you, you did have it, you know, Chavez was elected in, in 98. And then what happened? You had uh, Argentina and Brazil and Ecuador and Bolivia and Uruguay and Paraguay and Nicaragua and El Salvador. They all elected left government. This is the first time in, you know, <laughs> 500 years that you had anything like that. And the the, you know, that was the first decade of the 21st century. And since then, it's all been about rollback and trying to restore the power that the United States had in the region, because these governments began to change institutions. They actually changed the OAS some, by the way. Uh, you know, when if you look at the, the middle of the last uh, decade, uh, you had, uh, for example, or even even later in 2013, when the United States uh, refused to recognize the election in Venezuela, the left governments uh, in the OAS uh, forced them to, to do that. And so, uh, you know, there were, uh, but, but it was all, as you can see, it was just a temporary change and it was because you had all these left governments, but they were changing international relations in the hemisphere. They created their own organization, the Community for Latin American and Caribbean States, as an alternative to the OAS. And that made a difference because there you had uh, the countries would meet before they would go into the OAS. And then they would come out with a, they would have a common program like they did after the coup in Honduras, where, again, they fought against Hillary Clinton. And they fought against the U.S. government to try and reverse that coup, and they lost. But they, they, they were changing hemispheric relations. And what you've seen since then in so many countries and, you know, uh, is, is the United States uh, trying to roll it back by any means they can, including violence. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. I think, uh, you know, you could say that the only thing that the U.S. hates more than a successful left-wing government that might inspire similar models are attempts to create independent alliances and governing bodies that are outside of its control. Um, President Morales himself thinks that lithium, which Bolivia is very rich in and has played, has, has taken on a lot more importance, obviously played a role, but you know, um, I want to congratulate your organization for being such a, an early uh, whistleblower essentially on the fraud perpetrated by the OAS, and it must be bittersweet to be so vindicated, not just by the study finally acknowledged by the New York Times that contradicted its own reporting and editorializing about what happened in Bolivia for eight months, but several other studies that came after yours, scholarly academic studies that prove that the analysis of your organization, both preliminarily and then more comprehensively, turned out to be absolutely correct, and that the linchpin of this coup, allegations of fraud by the OAS, turned out itself to be um, fraudulent. So congratulations on that. And uh, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me about this. It's been super illuminating. Thank you, Glenn. 